Antiquities, a series of studies into Bible archaeology and history. I am E. Raymond Capt, biblical archaeologist and research historian. Our Creator has revealed many things to man in many ways. In addition to the written word of the Bible, we learn from creation itself and from the archaeological record of past civilizations. This series is designed to open your understanding to many truths, some of which may be new to you. Allow the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of Truth, and the Word of God to be your guide. This series is narrated by Paul H. Johnson. Gleanings from the Apocrypha I would like to start this Bible study with a question. What happened between the close of the Old Testament at the book of Malachi and the opening of the New Testament with the record of John the Baptist's preaching? The time covered by this blank period in Bible history is 400 years. Obviously much happened that affected God's people Israel. Some information is gained from the writings of Herodotus, the Greek historian who lived between 484 to 425 B.C. and is called the father of history. Archaeological excavations in the Middle East, and especially in Palestine, have produced vast quantities of relevant data, thus enabling scholars to recover much of the lost history of ancient civilizations. However, despite extensive scholarly work in the analysis of the physical record and the decipherment of the inscriptions and cuneiform writings, much of the newly available material sheds only limited light on the biblical historical records of those four centuries. There is another source of information on the history between the Old and New Testaments that most students of the Bible overlook. That source is the Apocryphal Writings, a collection of various authorships. Apocrypha is a Greek word meaning hidden or secret. It occurs in our Bible in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. In whom are hid, the word is Apocryphos, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Unfortunately, the word Apocrypha has acquired an unpleasant meaning, as of something that is unreliable or false. It is hard to see why this meaning should be applied to those books, for they are the product of Hebrew writers in the period between the Old and New Testaments, and do not appear to have been particularly secret or hidden at any time. With one exception, we have no knowledge of the personalities of the writers apart from a few hints to be gleaned from their books. Some are of composite authorship, component parts being in all probability of different dates. Their compositions are from around 300 B.C. to about 100 A.D., and their subjects include historical, inspired, and prophetic writings. The idea of forming a collection of holy books standing on a plane different from and higher than all others began to take concrete shape in all probability, towards the end of the 2nd century B.C. However, the actual formation of what we now understand as the canon of the Holy Scripture did not take place until about 100 to 120 A.D. Some scholars suggest the canon of the books went through three stages. First, the canon of the books of the Torah, or Law. Then, the prophetic books and lastly, the writings. Even after the canon of the Old Testament as we know it today, at the Council of Jamnia, about 90 A.D., disputes arose and continued for some time as to whether certain books should be regarded as canonical. The Greek translations of the Old Testament, known as the Septuagint text, contains all the books of the Hebrew Bible and, in addition, all the books of the Apocrypha. These latter, with two exceptions, are interspersed among the canonical books. It is interesting to note that the King James text of 1611 contained all of the Apocryphal books and after 100 years of being included were removed for only one reason. They had only been found in Greek translations and not in the Hebrew or Aramaic. However, 
since they have now all been found, both in Hebrew and Aramaic, among the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Qumran Caves in Palestine, their omission from the Protestant Bible should be re-examined. From earliest times, the books of the Apocrypha were used indiscriminately by Christians. It was not until the Reformation that a movement began to exclude them from the popular Bibles in use. Another fact that should be noted is that writers of the strongest Puritan outlook, like the 17th century English poet John Milton, noted for his Paradise Lost, were very clearly familiar with these books. References to them abound in Milton's poems without the slightest sign that he disapproved of them. It is significant that the Bible for use in an Anglican church must contain the Apocrypha, and the books are set for reading in the Church of England lectionary. Article 6 of the 39 articles in the Book of Common Prayer contain this note. The other books, meaning the books of the Apocrypha, the Church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners, but yet it doth not apply them to establish any doctrine. It should be pointed out that there is another collection of apocryphal literature that should not be confused with the apocryphal books of the period between the Old and New Testament. This is the Apocryphal New Testament, a collection of apocryphal gospels, acts of the epistles, and apocalypses. These are usually found today in book form with other narratives and fragments. Most were composed in the 3rd or 4th centuries A.D., and number over 200. Most of these were considered by the early church fathers to be heretical or spurious in nature, and many of the authors named are misleading to give some authenticity to the writings. A few, however, were considered by the early fathers as important and had a real chance of being included in the canon of the New Testament. Among these were the Epistle of Clement, Barnabas, the Revelation of Peter, and the Shepherd of Hermas. For a study of the Apocryphal New Testament, you are directed to the book by Oxford University Press of London. To return to our Apocryphal study, I would like to add that for the greater part of the Christian era, the Apocrypha formed part of the Christian Bible. Only in more modern times have some branches of the Christian Church changed their attitude toward these books. The Anglican and Lutheran churches now say the books are inspired, but not canonical. The Reformed or Protestant churches say they are neither inspired nor canonical. Many have appeared to have just ignored them completely. Whatever attitude one takes as to the authenticity of the apocryphal books, Bible students will find therein an elucidation of the scriptures in many areas. For example, the second book of Esdras, chapter 13, includes among many prophecies relating to the latter days a reference to the ten tribes which were led out of their own land at the time of Osea the king. The book of Tobit of the tribe of Naphtali gives an insight into life among the ten tribes in captivity. The first book of Maccabees, chapter 12, identifies the Spartans, called Lacedaemonians, with Israel. In the Apocrypha, we find belief in God is identical with that of the Old Testament. We note the conception of God as one, who reveals himself to man. Throughout the books of the Apocrypha, the Old Testament doctrine of the self-revelation of God is fundamental and is taken for granted. The only difference in the latter is that the revelation of the divine will is communicated through the agency of an angel. We find this in the book of Tobit. In the second book of Esdras, the divine messages come to the seer at times directly, at other times through the medium of an angel. In one place, the seer addresses himself directly to God, but when he concludes his word to the Almighty, he continues, and the angel that was sent to me, whose name was Uriel, gave me an answer. This is from 2 Esdras chapter 4, verse 1. Other similarities are passages which emphasize the unity of God. 
A passage in Ecclesiasticus chapter 36, verses 1 to 5 reads, Have mercy upon us, O Lord God of all, and behold us, and send thy fear upon all the nations that seek not after thee. Lift up thy hand against the strange nations, and let them see thy power, and let them know thee as we have known thee, that there is no God but only thou, O God. Similarly, in the Song of the Three Holy Children, verse 22, And let them know that thou art the Lord, the only God, and glorious over the whole world. And in the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 12, and verse 13, he writes, For neither is there any God but thou that careth for all, to whom thou mightest show that thy judgment is not upright. The creative activity of God is often spoken of in the Apocrypha. In the Song of the Three Children, in verse 35, we read, O all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord, praise and exalt him above all for ever. Then follows verses 36 to 68, enumerating his creation. In the rest of the book of Esther, which is found neither in the Hebrew nor in the Aramaic, nor among the Dead Sea Scrolls, chapter 13, verses 10 to 13 reads, For thou hast made heaven and earth, and all the wondrous things under the heaven. Thou art Lord of all things, and there is no man that can resist thee, which art the Lord. The fatherhood of God is expressed in Tobit, chapter 13, verse 4. He is our Lord, and God is our Father forever. And in Ecclesiasticus, chapter 23, verse 1. O Lord, governor of all my whole life, leave me not to their counsels, and let me not fall by them. The divine attributes of God find expression again and again throughout the apocryphal books. A few examples are Baruch chapter 4, verse 22. For my hope is in the everlasting, that he will save you, and joy is come unto me from the Holy One, because of the mercy which shall soon come unto you from the everlasting, our Savior. In Judith chapter 9, verse 14, and make every nation and tribe to acknowledge that thou art the God of all power and might, and that there is none other that protecteth the people of Israel but thou. Ecclesiasticus chapter 43, verses 18 to 20 reads, He seeketh out the deep and the heart, and considereth their crafty devices. For the Lord knoweth all that may be known, and he beholdeth the signs of the world. He declareth the things that are past, and for to come, and revealeth the steps of hidden things. No thought escapeth him, neither is any word hidden from him. The righteousness of God is frequently proclaimed in the Apocrypha. Tobit chapter 3 verse 2 states, O Lord, Thou art just, and all thy works and all thy ways are mercy and truth, and thou judgest truly and justly forever. Verses 3 to 5 in the Song of the Three Holy Children reiterates the righteousness of God. Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers. Thy name is worthy to be praised and glorified forevermore. For thou art righteous in all things that thou hast done unto us. Yea, true are all thy works, thy ways are right, and all thy judgments truth. In all the things that thou hast brought upon us, and upon the holy city of our fathers, even Jerusalem, thou hast executed true judgment, for according to truth and judgment didst thou bring all these things upon us because of our sins. Attention should be drawn to another tenet in the doctrine of God that was assimilated by the writers of the Apocrypha, namely, that God is the God of history. Whatever difficulties one may have in regards to this, and with these we are not here concerned, it is quite clear 
that the writers of these books shared the prophetic teaching. Ecclesiasticus chapter 29, verse 23. As he hath turned the waters into saltness, so shall the heathen inherit his wrath. What this is saying is, just as all natural happenings in the world are the outcome of God's will, so the happenings in the world's history are ordained by him. This is expressed in fuller detail by the same writer. Reading from chapter 36, verses 6 to 12. Show new signs, and make other strange wonders. Glorify thy right arm, that they may set forth thy wondrous works. Raise up indignation, and pour out wrath. Take away the adversary, and destroy the enemy. Make the time short, remember the covenant, and let them declare thy wondrous works. Let him that escapeth be consumed by the rage of the fire, and let him perish that oppress the people. Smite in sunder the hands of the rulers of the heathen that say, There is none other but we. Gather all the tribes of Jacob together, and inherit thou them as from the beginning. O Lord, have mercy upon thy people that is called by thy name, and upon Israel, whom thou hast named thy firstborn. Similarly, in the prayer of Judas Maccabeus, we read in 1 Maccabees chapter 4 and verses 30 to 33. And when he saw that mighty army, he prayed and said, Blessed art thou, O Savior of Israel, who didst quell the violence of the mighty man by the hand of thy servant David, and gavest the host of strangers into the hands of Jonathan the son of Saul, and his armor-bearer. Shut up this army in the hand of thy people Israel, and let them be confounded in their power and horsemen. Make them to be of no courage, and cause the boldness of their strength to fall away, and let them quake at their destruction. Cast them down with the sword of them that love thee, and let all those praise thee with thanksgiving." Time does not permit a lengthy examination, book by book, of the Apocrypha. However, it is strongly recommended that all Bible students interested in Christian truth do so. In the time remaining, I would like to bring your attention to the book of Esdras. The name Esdras is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Ezra. The first book of Esdras, with the exception of the story of the three young guardsmen at the court of Darius, as in chapters 3 and 4, follows the canonical books of the second book of Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Apparently Josephus, book 11, volume 1, used this book as his authority for this period of history. If this is so, it indicates that it must have been an established authority for history in his day. There are, however, some historical errors and inconsistencies in the book, it seems the compiler was not so concerned about historical sequence as to record how it came about that the temple was rebuilt and its services re-inaugurated under Zerubbabel. Both the beginning and the conclusion are abrupt, suggesting that we do not have the book in its original complete form. It appears to be an incomplete extract from a larger work, or it may conceivably be due to the original manuscript having been damaged. The second book of Esdras was originally called the Apocalypse of Ezra, and consisted only of chapters 3 to 14, which are purely apocalyptic. The attention of the Bible student is naturally drawn to the book, since there is some reference to the ten tribes of Israel carried into Assyrian captivity during the reign of Hosea. This is found in the second book of Esdras, chapter 13, and verses 40 to 45, which read, Those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea the king, whom Salmanassar the king of Assyria led away captive. And he carried them over the waters, and so they came into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt, 
that they might there keep their statutes, which they had never kept in their own land. And they entered into Euphrates by the narrow passages of the river. For the Most High then showed signs for them, and held still the flood, till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, and the same region is called Arsareth. The second book of Estrus opens with the reminder of God's past mercies for his people Israel. The prophet challenges them for their present plight and the fundamental cause of their captivity. His accusation against them is the same as our Lord declared of his generation. Reading from the second book of Estrus, chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. I sent unto you my servants the prophets, who ye have taken and slain, and torn their bodies in pieces, whose blood I will require of your hands, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Almighty Lord, Your house is desolate, I will cast you out as the wind doth stubble. This is followed by an appeal from God for his people Israel to return unto him. Assurance is given of peace and joy if they will only heed the call. Thus, prophetically, we are here shown the means for our protection in these days when God's judgments are upon the earth. When Israel heeds the call, Ezra's declared, reading from chapter 2, verses 28 to 30, The heathen shall envy thee, but they shall be able to do nothing against thee, saith the Lord. My hands shall cover thee, so that thy children shall not see hell. Hell meaning separation from God. Be joyful, O thou mother, with thy children, for I will deliver thee, saith the Lord. Keep in mind that Esdras, or Ezra, was a prophet of God when Judah and Benjamin returned from Babylonian captivity to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Here we have the prophet promising that mothers have a right to claim divine protection for their offspring. At the outbreak of World War I, Rev. William Pascoe Gord, a Methodist minister, held a special service in his Canadian church for a group of mothers and their sons that had been drafted for war duty and ordered to England for training. After sustaining prayers for their offspring, they claimed the right of divine protection on the battlefields for their sons. At the end of the long hostilities, every one of those boys returned to their homes. An examination of the second book of Esdras, from chapter 3 and onward, shows a series of revelations and visions in which Esdras is instructed in some of the great mysteries of the moral world and is assured of the final triumph of the righteous. The first of these revelations is given in chapter 4. The second is found in chapter 5, verse 31 and onward through chapter 6, amplifying the first, showing the gradual process of the divine plan and the terrible climax wrought by sinful man. The third revelation is given in chapter 7 through chapter 8 and describes the coming of the Messiah and the last scenes of judgment. Verse 50 sums them up in these words, For many great miseries shall be done to them that in the latter time shall dwell in the world, because they have walked in great pride. Then follows three visions. The first, in chapter 9, starting with verse 38, is of a woman lamenting the death of her son on his bridal day, and the vision continues to chapter 10, verse 26. The second vision, starting with chapter 11, verse 1, is of an eagle that came up from the sea, which had twelve feathered wings and three heads. As Ezra looked, the eagle suffered strange transformations until rebuked by, as it were, a roaring lion. It is consumed. This vision continues to chapter 12, verse 3. The third and last vision, starting with chapter 13, verse 1, is of a man, obviously the Lord, against whom the nations of the earth are gathered. The man beheld the multitude that came against him, but he neither lifted up his hand, nor held a sword, nor any instrument of war. Reading from verse 10. 
But only that I saw he sent out of his mouth, as it had been a blast of fire, and out of his lips a flaming breath, and out of his tongue he cast out sparks and tempests. Chapter 14 gives an account of Esdras being commanded to take five men who could write swiftly, namely Saria, Dabris, Selenia, Achinus, and Asiel, and write what God would reveal to them. Reading from verse 44. In forty days they wrote two hundred four books, and it came to pass, when the forty days were fulfilled, that the highest spake, saying, The first that thou hast written publish opening, that the worthy and unworthy may read it, but keep the seventy last, that thou mayest deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. Chapters 15 and 16 contain strong prophecies regarding the woes which shall come upon the earth. This book concludes with an exhortation to Israel to gather her faith in the midst of all the trials with which she shall be visited. Prophetically, God promised Esdras, reading from verses 73 to 75, Then shall they be known who are my chosen, and they shall be tried as the gold in the fire. Hear, O ye my beloved, saith the Lord, Behold, the days of trouble are at hand, but I will deliver you from the same. Be ye not afraid, neither doubt, for God is your guide. It must be said in conclusion that in reading the apocryphal literature, one cannot fail to be impressed by the reality and sincerity and depth of belief in God among the writers their conviction that God is ever-present, ever-guiding, and ever-active among those who are faithful to Him is very inspiring. This alone should make the books of the Apocrypha dear to all. I hope you have enjoyed this study in Biblical Antiquities, covering archaeological research in the Bible lands that has led to a proper understanding of the biblical text